I'm absolutely delighted to be here with Anne today, Anne Dudley. It's about 10 years since I've been here because uh, about 10 years ago I did about three years of drum programming yeah. and, and doing sounds and stuff like that. It was the, be the best paid scholarship there ever was. <laughs> <laughs> Oh bless you! <laughs> I'm glad you got. I'm glad you got paid anyway. <laughs> it's brilliant. So I think maybe start upstairs yeah, where, sure. you, where you where the, where it all begins. Yes, okay. indeed. So follow me up here. So this wasn't here when. No. Well, when we first uh, when we first came here, it was only a single story oh. extension, and we built this on the top. And getting the piano up here was uh, quite entertaining. And this is where I sort of. Work. Really? So how, how, how does it work? How does it work? Well, this is a piano. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, have you always preferred B Bosendorfers? Uh, yeah, I do like Bosendorfers. And somebody pointed out to me they have a particularly beautiful middle section. You oh. know this bit? <laughs> Just around there. Right. And, and that seems to be a very nice sort of warm area to mm -hmm. start working in, you know, when you... And, and when I'm playing the piano, I'm, I'm, I'm always sort of trying to hear the orchestration, you know, in my, in my head, you know, right. what it's going to be like. And I never have any trouble with that, so sometimes it's quite difficult conveying that to other people. But, it, you know, I, I just find the pianos are just an endlessly fascinating Absolutely. instrument. And I find with, with a live piano, more than a sampled one, you do less because it, there's there's well there's more it, overtones. You, you've got this subtlety of the pedal, um, yeah. which is a very difficult thing to do, even on the best samples, Absolutely. because pedal is such a complicated and subtle uh, aspect of piano playing. Chaotic, almost, yeah. Yeah. So you've got a little. Yes. Well, what happens, you see, is here. Ah, I've got so my Pro Tools. Tools. And because I'm an improviser, really, I like to improvise there. I've got the film up there. Um, <clears throat> I play the film and sort of improvise along. And when I'm ready to record something, I put on this little foot switch here. And what I've done is will now be recorded. And I can sort of improvise away and then I can stop and then I can think, well, I didn't like much of that, but there was a bit there that was quite good and extract that bit and then sort of do another take and, and then scribble something down. Oh, let me show you an example of my scribbling down. I like to work quickly, you see. I don't like things to get in the way. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like faffing. So I'll get my paper and I'll scribble something down. And um, <clears throat> I was very pleased once I saw um, an interview with Emma Thompson. Right. And she said when she writes screenplays, when she's sort of in the mood, she writes very, very quickly and very messily on, um, in by hand. Yeah on a sort of A4 pad and then because she needs to get it down really really quickly and then after she's done that she'll do a neat copy and, and in fact my first manuscript you know when I first write something it's appallingly messy but when I come sort of do my proper scoring it's, it's very neat. And is, so that's, is that just an aid memoir for you really or? Yeah. You, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah but I'm, I'm very quick at doing it so <clears throat> I've uh, it sort of begins to take shape, really, when, I, when I've written it down. I'm a very I'm a traditionist like that, right. I suppose. Looking that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what's the next step? So you, you, you lay it in and then you, you, you do a quick manuscript yeah. sketch. Um, well, then it depends on the nature of the beast, really. If it's going to be um, a conventional orchestration, and, and people need a demo, I'll take it downstairs and start working on a demo of it with, you know, samples and things. Sure. Um, and if you're working free, so you don't work to a, to a metronome? Uh, yes, yeah, sometimes I do. I have this little um, wonderful... Oh, a proper one. Tama. I was very pleased to see that the wonderful drummer, Ralph Sammons, has the same little, <laughs> little uh, Tama rhythm watch, simple. Can't go wrong. <laughs> but if you're working free, is there a kind of clicking process? Uh, yes. Um, <clears throat> I will... Because um, when we're recording in the in studio, we're virtually always going to use a click because if you don't, you know, you're mm -hmm. really sort of giving yourself too many problems, really. So Roger, 
will um, devise a wonderful click which will feel quite natural on the Ritterdandos okay. and Accelerandos and things like that. Right. And do you ever, because you often conduct, don't you? Do, yeah. you, ever, do you ever use streamers or...? Um, no, I don't. I used to. Um, nowadays, because I get to know what the click's going to do, I don't need them, yeah. really. And I found that the players are fine with quite random click. They seem to have got used to them. It's amazing what you yeah. can make sound incredibly natural, and it's, it's really like the swan, isn't it? Over uh, uh, above water, it's all elegant and sounds completely natural. And underneath, you've got this incredibly complex. <laughs> well, there's five in that bar, yes, and then no, there's eight for that. It does Ritter sound Dango. so ugly, doesn't it? And they'll often, it'll often make them last, laugh when you're rehearsing. Through yeah, it. it's like what? <laughs> and then you explain what it, where it, where it all happens, and they're quite happy with it. Yeah, yeah it's a, I've only recently done a score where I, I didn't just do that thing of work, doing a tempo map before I started writing, which I think is quite common these days. And it just struck me that, that tempi is a form of expression just like loud and soft. And mm. so, so much film music is very metronomic because yeah. it's quite convenient and you can record it quickly. Yeah. And, and I do that as well sometimes, mm -hmm. but you're quite right. You know, if you restrict yourself to a tempo map before you've even started, mm -hmm. You're making a straight jacket for yourself, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and you know that might not be the best way of doing it. Yeah. yeah. So uh, flexibility is a good, good plan, really. So you, uh, do you you still orchestrating by by hand? Yes. Wow. Yes. In fact, um, I'm I working. remember there used to be a little cassette player. <laughs> <laughs> we moved on from it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we have because we now have this wonderful little remote device. Have you come across these? No. Oh gosh, this is. You need one of these. This is a, a transport thing. This this works as Pro Tools, you know. It's oh. fantastic. So I can sit here and uh, it's, it's ever so simple, but it works either Pro Tools or iTunes, whatever you tell it. But uh, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm still. I just sort of think. I think through through my pencil. Um, wow. And I'm writing this piece for Joshua Bell, the violinist, and. You know, I just have to do it by hand. You know, that's the way it that's is. The way um, I have wonderful assistant who would then put it in Sibelius and make it all, give us all lovely parts, but... Um, and at which point, if people are wanting um, sample demos, at which point do you orchestrate on the page first and then...? Yes, you have to, really, yeah. um, which means sometimes you're doing the job two or three times, yes. which is, you know, one of those inevitable things that happens, but uh, I don't think there's any way around that. No. I can't remember who was saying that new technology never, never makes, it gives us more possibilities, but it never makes our lives easier. No, no, not really. Um, I did a lovely film with a real sort of traditional director, Paul Verhoeven, recently, oh, Elle, wow. and Paul used to work with Jerry Goldsmith, so he's got some wonderful stories and he's mm. great to work with because he's... You know, he's, he's into the melody, you know, mm. and, and the bare bones of it. And he comes and he sits and I play stuff on the piano and he gets it. He yeah. absolutely gets it. He so he's, ne he's never bothered about having demos and he never, so he, he doesn't have an army of producers around him who all have to sort of sign off on everything. So it's a real sort of old fashioned way of working. I love it. It's great. Oh, I bet. And it must be so much fun for the director. Well, it's, he comes to the studio and he beams away because he's just heard it on the piano and then it's got, you know, full orchestration and he's, yeah, it's great. <laughs> Fantastic. That's brilliant. I mean, it's something that you, I'm, I've noticed it, um, when we were working together, something I was impressed by is, is that you have a skill of being able to change things on the stand as well because you're inside the, the orchestration. Mm. And that is, I guess, one of the things you have to do if, if you're not demoing stuff up is, is to... To be flexible, yeah. yeah, and to know what you can do. And I mean, our musicians are so quick, you know, and I can scribble out something on a piece of manuscript paper and take it over to somebody and say, play that instead. Yeah. And they're fine. You know? And do you prefer to, you know, try and work here wherever possible when you're working with musicians in, in, in the UK? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah. It's um, kind of diminishing returns, isn't it? It can be, you know, flying well, out to places. Yes. Um, I mean, it's cheaper mm. and it's not as good. No. End of. <laughs> no, absolutely. I see you've got a. Is this a new addition to the? No, no, no. I, I had this. Actually, has been in the loft for a while, but I've recently used it on a project. This was my first serious electric piano. It's a Wurlitzer electric piano, and I probably had it in about 1978. Wow. I, I know, and it's 
it's just quite a unique sound, you know. It's uh, um, uh, you see, you're immediately in hot chocolate, aren't you? <laughs> you're, you're my sexy. You're what's it? You sexy thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, what I love about I think I prefer Wurlitzers to Fender Rhodes is because they have they can be really mellow and Celeste like, mm. but then get super they tramp and angry. Yeah. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're great, and um, we record. We, we recently recorded it. You have to, you have to stick a little. Oh dear, you have to stick this in the because um, you don't want the audio because it's got an inbuilt speaker. Yeah. You have to sort of uh, kill that. And we really recently recorded it on a project, and it sounds great. Yeah, yeah <laughs> and really so wonderful. it um, it probably won't stay here forever, but uh, I, I'm sort of quite fond of it at the moment. And I see over here. Yeah, well, that I keep meaning to try and sell that, but I can't bring myself to do oh. it because it's a classic. Oh, it is. And yeah. I've used that on a lot of records, including um, The Look of Love for uh, ABC, actually. And it is customised, this is mini move, I'll have you know, Ooh. because here, I don't usually play it in this position, by the way. <laughs> uh, like th this, this is a ribbon, ah. which enables you to bend notes up and down. Oh, I've never seen Oh, I know, not many people have got one of those. <laughs> but, um, I mean, when I first got this, this was my, like my first serious synthesizer, because up to then I'd had sort of toy synthesizers, really. I had yeah. a Korg 700 and a mm -hmm. 700S. But this taught me so much about synthesizers because it has these three oscillators, and then you just have to... It has no presets. No. So you have to learn what all those knobs are going to do. And um, you learn an awful lot about um, synthesizers. I, I've got... A, <laughs> I, I bought it second hand. Gosh, I bought it second hand. Can you believe that? Mm -hmm. And it cost a lot of money. It was probably 300 quid or something. Maybe even more, which was a lot in mm -hmm. 1980. Um, and the guy who sold it to me sold me a, a little book which had charts in it and... and um, How you could program. It, well, yes, if you found a sound that you liked, you, I used to write down on all, oh, yeah, all, all the all settings. The, yeah. <laughs> That's funny how it never sounded the same again when you come back <laughs> to it. Oh, there you go. And I have to say, I, there are very few bits of music where I, I knew where... I can remember where I was and and what I was doing when I heard it, but you, you're responsible for three. Oh. One is Close to the Edit, which oh, right. is, was like, what is that? The other is Moments in Love. Is, it, is that right, the right title? Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. And then um, Buffalo Girls for the Video, because they introduced yeah, 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 the UK yeah. to breakdancing. Okay. But when did you make the switch to samplers and, and what, what, was, what was your first sampler? Well, the first sampler that I used was Trevor Horn's um, great investment in the 1980s, which was a fair right. light. And that was really the first of the sampling keyboards that you could get. Yeah. And it had huge limitations. Yeah. Um, in fact, it, it, people forget that the, the actual length of sample that you could get was really short, less than two seconds. And they were immensely expensive, weren't they? <clears throat> immensely expensive. It was, a, it was the, an investment sort of the same as a luxury car or something. Or right. It was about 25, 30,000 quid, which was a lot. Yes. It's a lot now, but it's, it yeah. was an enormous amount in the 80s. And, um, but the thing is about the Fairlight is because it had a sort of sound. I mean, it was state of the art, but actually the sound was really retro. Yeah. You'd sort of sample in an orchestra, a sort of an orchestral stab or something, and it would come out sounding like a recording from the 1920s because all the, all the top had gone off it. Yeah. You know, it didn't come back. Nothing above 8K came back at all. Okay. So had it not been for the genius of our engineer, Gary Langan, at Psalm Studios where we were working, who used all the equipment that he ever had, <laughs> all that stuff in the racks yeah. that you see in a studio, he used it all, I think, in order to make this thing sound halfway decent. And it was almost the limitations of it that made us, forced us to be inventive. OK. And that famous Yelp from Close to the Edit, that, that's, that's, that's gone elsewhere, hasn't it? Uh, what, the hay? The hay, hey. yes. Hay! Yeah. yeah, that was sampled famously by um, the Prodigy, yes. bless them. <laughs> Oh, we like we love them. <laughs> Liam's a Liam's a neighbour of ours at okay. the H HQ down the road. Yeah, okay. That's brilliant, fantastic. So should we go? Yes. Go down um, to the.
Brilliant. Right. And this is Roger Dudley. So this is where my yes. right hand oh. man lurks. <laughs> um, <laughs> My Fantastic. collaborator in all things. And <clears throat> my little domain is over here. So let's start where um, stations around here. Um, I have a very simple controller. I'm not into, um, I don't like these touch sensitive keyboards when it comes to doing the stuff that I do here. I just want a very straightforward thing that works. Ah, here we go. Um, so you're into Logic here. Logic. I have Logic Pro, uh, which I quite like. I use it in a very straightforward way. EXS24 is a um, very nice, basic... I'm a fan. Yeah, yeah it's, it's just... I like things that just work, really. I have a few soft synths. I've got uh, Absynth and a few nice little plug-in things and some very old stuff in the rack that frankly I don't use very much. I think that's my fault, that, that horrible thing. Yeah. But to be honest, I'm... I switched it on this morning for the first time in about five years and I said, what's this? <laughs> it doesn't sound very good, does it? <laughs> no. This sounds quite good, this uh, cork thing. Yes. Use some sounds on that. Great. I used to like this Roland here. I haven't used it for a while. Right. Um, D550. Okay. Yeah, that's it. Excellent. So you're all patched in around there and then round to where Rogers. Mm -hmm. You're not on radar anymore. No, unfortunately. I, I used get, to love radar. I'm thinking of get, oh. getting one because I find if you. I know that you can edit in radar these days. Yes. But I find if you can edit, you do edit. As opposed to. I've been wanting to write an album of stuff which is performance based and i think that's what's right. so great because it is digital but it's it, it's, just... it feels analog doesn't yeah it? especially absolutely. the controller yeah which is so good about it i used to have two here and when we started with the 24 track two inch which used to sit over the yeah. great big tub of a machine uh you used to have to line it up for half an hour every day before we used it and then i went to radar I had two radars which i really 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 liked they sounded great as yeah. Well. yeah and but I, and i stuck with them for ages but everywhere i went it was pro tools yeah and uh, in the end, we, well, gave, up. we gave in. <laughs> yeah. There was a phase, wasn't there, where um, the sound departments would use, like, is it was it audio file or something like that? So you'd go into dubs and there'd be all of these different systems running, but now it's pretty much universally yeah. Pro, Tools. Pro Tools. So you just deliver, mm -hmm. instead yeah. of delivering audio files, you're now delivering no, deliver Pro Tools. Absolutely. sessions. Yeah. Always, yeah, 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 I know. You don't even have to ask whether they've got it, you know, no. everyone has it, so Absolutely. You know, it's, it's universal. Mm. So this is a jade? So, yeah, well, yes. I mean, with the radar and the jade was perfect together, of course. Right. And it was automated. But nowadays, it's just a, a place to put a keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really, it's really, really fancy table. It's mad, isn't it? <laughs> yes. I use it for recording, obviously, because you need, you need mics. You need to plug your mics in somewhere. So yeah. uh, that gets so you used use the preamps on the desk. Mostly. I've got a nice fo couple of nice focus rights down there. OK. But, uh, yeah. Uh, but after that, it's all in the box because it's recallable so you know why would you use eq on the desk anymore and you know, all that sort of thing so it's most of it's redundant really it, i need to change it i need something that's you know 12 channels got some nice nice preamp nice mic amps on it uh, nice comms unit yeah um, maybe a patch bay nice meters and that's about it <laughs> well we've been to quite a few places that there seems to be uh, a Gathering enthusiasm for an, there's an there's a SSL yeah, that incorporates brilliant yeah incorporates brilliantly with with Pro that. Tools. Yeah. I'm just it seems to have the endorsement of a lot of yes. very good people yes. who f for them it's a combination of having the stuff that's good about the SSL, the integration with Pro Tools that feels seamless. Yes. But also it's really it's a solid bit of kit that never goes wrong. Yeah. If a lot yeah. of these studios can't afford to have on site no, uh, service right. people. Yeah, so yeah. Well Neve do one as well, don't they? Yeah. It's called I mean, it's got a funny name, but uh, that looks quite good as well. But they're quite you know, they're a lot of money and really yeah. it's not gonna make my sound much difference because <laughs> it's all in it's all in there. Yeah. So it's difficult justifying it at the moment, but I guess the time will come. Absolutely. And so you've got PMCs. Mm. PMCs, yeah. Yep. So they're my main stereo monitors. Lovely, but uh, I use these little focals. That I've got a 5.1 set up here. Right. Um, I normally have another one above here, but um, I don't, when, I, when I'm recording, I'm recording stereo mainly. mainly. Okay. Only when I get to mix mode do I switch to 5.1 and then use this little controller here. 
the audience oh, for guess. the um, which works Brilliant. really well. Um, yeah. Brilliant stuff. And do you do having to kind of organise all of the stemming and all of that kind of yes. stuff? Yes. Um, stemming. <laughs> really, yeah. Don't get me started on that one. It can, well, it can end it? awfully, can't it? it? Can, it we know. Oh, <laughs> tell me about it. Only oh, well, the other day. The other day. There's a film, quite a quite well-known film, where we gave them stems, and on one particular cue, they've moved one of the stems. Yes, I've had that happen. The drums. They moved um, the, the drums. drums. Not by a beat, but by about two and a bit beats. Yeah. And when we listen to this, we cringe. It's on the film. It's dubbed. The drums is out of time. Yeah. Nobody noticed. How weird. So I, I must admit... Except your peers, who well, go, yeah, well, what, think, what, what was Anne God, thinking? What, you what know. a mess that is. <laughs> and do you ever t attend dubs? I have done, yeah. yeah. Mm. yeah. We're not the most welcome profession. No, you feel, feel a bit like a pork chop at a Jewish wedding, or <laughs> what's that expression? You know, it's like, oh, you've come to the dub. Oh, OK. Mm. Yeah. We did film once <laughs> where we dubbed it in Germany and they were a bit short and crew and I we went both went there and I ended up on the desk doing the music dub. Yeah. And that's really interesting actually, actually being the person putting the music in. Because yeah. then you, you can really see it from the dub point of view because you know we all want the music loud, but at the same time you're listening to the dialogue and stuff and so you're trying to keep it back. Yeah. It's uh, quite educational actually. Um am I right in saying um your career started as a session player? Is that is that right? Yeah, I suppose that's fair enough to say. I mean, at a very early stage in my career, I um, I used to, when I was at college, in order to earn a bit of money, I used to go and play in bands at night, um, play keyboards, mm -hmm. and um, I met Trevor Horn, who was also doing the same thing, playing uh, bass. Playing bass. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but he was also very ambitious and just starting to do, produce mm -hmm. things, and uh, I had my Wurlitzer piano and some synthesizer on the top and he said to me um, I really like the sound of that Wurlitzer do, do you hire it out and I said no if 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 you want the Wurlitzer you've got to have me as well <laughs> that's brilliant <laughs> so so he thought oh, God, okay well I'll, you know would you come and do a session for us and you know this was like sort of doing demos for publishers, because in those days people didn't have their own home studios, and publishers used to pay people to produce demos for songwriters, right. and so that's how we started, how we got to know each other. And Trevor's career sort of <clears throat> went ballistic, yeah. and um, he called me up, and you know we started working together in the in the eighties. Right. And did you? So were you reading music at school? Is that correct? Uh, uh, college. <clears throat> I went to the Royal College of Music. Okay, right, gotcha. Yeah, and um, did, you know, degrees and things. And we mentioned earlier that Lexicon of Love was kind of your first foray into string arranging yeah, professionally. Yeah, ABC, Trevor produced ABC's Lexicon of Love and he, I was playing keyboards on it mm -hmm. and they wanted a really big sound. And uh, they said, um, could you do a string arrangement? And I said, yeah, because you say yes to everything when you're 20, don't you? <laughs> and uh, well, what I really used to love in pop music was the sound of Philadelphia, you know, those great, very beautifully arranged and produced records which had horns and brass and strings and with a rhythm section. And so it was my little sort of ambition to make a record that sounded as great as those right and uh, with the look of love that was the biggest section that I'd ever had we right. had about right. 30 people in Abbey Road one wow. and uh, I was the youngest person in the room you oh, know? <laughs> and since then I mean you've you've done so much but also it's been so incredibly varied what took you into film music? Was that an ambition that you had or...? or... Yes, I suppose, really, I would have liked to have been a film composer from the word go, but I had right. no idea how you got into it. Right. So, you know, I just sort of did what came along. But what happened was a lot of people used the art of noise stuff because I was in the art of noise for films, mm -hmm. um, videos and all sorts of things, adverts. And so it became sort of quite a natural progression filmmakers would then come to us and ask us to do tracks for them and I loved that I loved that working to picture and then I started working for um, there was a lot of adverts in the 80s it was a great way into writing for picture sure. and I, I used to write ads for 
you know, all sorts of things. And that, again, sort of just teaches you how to do, how to work quickly, how to change things on the, on the, on the go and how to sort of work to picture, really. Those, those sessions are quite, I recall, being quite demanding. You used to do a whole series of Stella Artois. Didn't Stella Artois, yeah. yeah. And you get the, the standard advertising session with musicians is an hour. Oh, wow. So they'd go from hour. one studio to the other, wouldn't yeah, they? Yeah, but they used to, yeah. yeah. In, the, in the 80s, people would start work at 8 o'clock in the morning, do an 8 to 9, and then a 10 to 1 somewhere else, and, you know, keep it going for 12 hours a day. But uh, those days are long gone. Mm. But, uh, no, I, used, I, I love the Stella Artois one. You've always embraced technology. How, how has that changed your workflow over, over the years? Um, obviously, you're still working when you can on you know, paper and yeah, pen. Yeah, but I've always loved technology. You know, as yeah. a keyboard player in, in the 80s, that was like the heyday of new synthesizers, new technology all the time. And, in fact, I remember very vividly um, being in Nova Studios in London, which was a t there were studios everywhere in London, which was a tiny little studio behind Selfridges, and this very elegant, tall German chap walked in with this new synthesizer called a Prophet 5. Mm. And it was the first polyphonic synthesizer I'd ever heard. And Hans Zimmer then played a wonderful <laughs> chord of D minor on this polyphonic synthesizer with the reverb from you know the engineer and it was like oh, that sounds amazing <laughs> you know um, and so yes yeah, so synthesizers I've always loved them really um, I've you know I'm not one of those people who have banks of old-fashioned synthesizers all around though yeah. because you know uh, the technology is great but uh, I'm not wild about the technology being the main driver you know i'd yes. rather get the music right really and technology makes that much easier nowadays yeah. but you know if i'm doing an electronic score i can still get really turned on by sounds and sort of start with a sound and get really sort of excited about you know all sorts of your beautiful samples <laughs> It could be a good starting point for a blank screen, can't it? Yeah. It can. It, yeah. it, it, you need somewhere to start, don't you, mm -hmm. really? And, and if you're having a bad day and you want a bit of inspiration, then, you know, you troll through a load of samples and sure. something will trigger you off. And the industry is, is, has changed quite radically over the last 15 years. You and I have spoken at length, I think, about the concerns about how we get paid and stuff. Do you have any advice for young people who are permanently being asked to do things for free and stuff and how to it's really tricky you know yeah. um because people expect you to do demos especially for adverts for free yeah because um there's so many people who will do them for free um i think you sort of you'd be foolish not to you know but yeah. on the other hand once you've got your job, stand up for your rights, you know, make sure you keep your publishing if you possibly can. Yeah. Don't let somebody take your copyrights off you. Um, but the, the business is brutal now. Yeah. Um, you know, for, I think, you know, there's less, far less money around. Yeah, yeah. That is a, is a, is a tricky one. And I'm sure that you have lots of young composers playing you stuff and... It, what advice do you give to people about, you know, developing their compositional, not, not the kind of career aspect of things, the compositional? Well, I think you could never stop learning. Mm -hmm. And I encourage people to look at scores of great orchestral music and try and understand how it's been put together mm -hmm. and try and understand those colours and the yeah. combination of colours. So that's one thing. Listen to as much music as you can but also if you're if you are developing a career as a composer it's very very useful to have your own outlet as an artist yeah. you know because being in the art of noise has been was incredibly um, important to me as an outlet for sort of wild creative stuff yeah. and also as uh, it gives you a sort of kudos as a composer as well yeah. so I would say to young people try and you know develop your own, get your own thing going. And it's the one thing that's very easy to have these days, it's an outlet. Well, yeah. that's much more easy now yeah. with technology and all the, all, the, all, the, all the outlets you've got for, for sort of getting your music out there. 
completely. I think that's really good advice. I mean, looking through your career, there's there's so much that you've done from being composer in residence for the BBC. And is there anything out there that you still really, one day, I'd like to do <laughs> that? Well, not really, because I just love doing a variety of things. I think it keeps you fresh. You know, I'm writing a concert piece at the moment for Joshua Bell, the violinist. Yeah. And it's a real challenge. It's, you, you know, if you're writing to picture, the picture dictates the structure of the music. You know where you are. You're writing a concert piece, you're on your own. Yeah. <laughs> so I love that challenge, but I wouldn't want to do that all the time. And I'm also doing a long running TV thing at the moment. I'm doing Pole Dark, yeah. which I absolutely love because we've done, what, 17 hours of television. Wow. And that's, that's fantastic in order to really develop themes and ideas and, you know, the, the, super, the, the long form, super long form. And, yeah. you know, I think there's a lot to be said for that. It's much, it's much more, um, sometimes a, a long running TV is much more rewarding than a, a film, which even if it's two hours long, that's, that's not. That's not that long, is it, yeah, really? Yeah, yeah. I remember the f uh, actually working with you on The Tenth Kingdom, which was an absolutely oh, mammoth yeah, job, wasn't yeah. it? it was about 10, 10 hours of massive orchestral hours. stuff, wasn't yeah. it? But um, there isn't the snobbery about TV that there they used to be. You're either a film or, or mm. a TV composer. I think that used to be, especially in America. Yeah. But uh, I think a lot of British composers do do both. But, yeah. you, but you're right, actually, the, the distinction is gone because big TV is, you know, where a lot of people think it's at. Well, very desirable. If you could go back now, as the composer you are today, to you maybe in the early 80s, is there anything that you'd like to tell yourself, the composer back then? Stay calm. I mean, we've all had situations where it gets a bit tense in yeah. the studio and we all get a bit nervous and the director's going off on a tangent. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can really undermine your own confidence. And I think my, my advice now and, and how I am now, I stay calm, yeah. you know, because it's music. It's, it's wonderful. We're in this industry because we love it, because it entertains people, because it brightens up their lives, because it just makes things better. Mm. It's, nobody's going to die. Yeah. OK, so there will be music. Just, you know, calm down and don't panic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I, actually, so in a nutshell, my advice is don't panic. Keep calm and Keep carry calm. on. Well, that's so corny. <laughs> yeah, but there is something to, to be said for getting a little bit older because you stay calmer. And you know you just get to the end. The end will appear, even though sometimes it appears that the end is such a distant prospect. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you so much for your time, Anna. Not so at lovely all. to be back it's, here. It's, it's lovely to see you again. We did some great stuff together. Yeah, absolutely. I shall absolutely. call you again. Christian, <laughs> come down and program this rhythm for me. I'm having trouble.